Hey everybody, Pete A. Turner, executive producer and host of your Break It Down show. Today's episode is a heavy one. We have three people on as guests. We don't often go this big, but I thought in this case it was important. Scott and I co-host. The subject is a documentary called The Gift, which tells the tale of Corporal Jason Dunham, who on the 14th of April 2004 in Baghdad, Iraq, jumped on a grenade saving the lives of two Marines immediately next to him and possibly several others in the area. He did not survive the blast. His commander at the time, who was then Captain Trent Gibson, now Colonel Trent Gibson, also joins the movie makers, Rick and David. This is ultimately a story of sacrifice, valor, leadership, and brotherhood, and the movie is incredible. I should also mention that that Vinny Rocco Vargas, who's been on the show before, and you guys see him on the Mayans, also an Army veteran, is a co-producer on the show, so there's a lot of names that we're familiar with. This is a powerful, powerful episode, and I know you're going to enjoy it. The things I want you to pull out of this, though, really are the leadership aspects of what it means for these Marines to go out and care for each other. I think we all can learn a lot from that. Okay, a couple things real quick. If you like what we're doing, if you're new to the show, subscribe. Put five stars and wherever you listen, write a little review. That truly helps us a lot. That helps other people discover it. If you send the show off to a friend, say, hey, this is a really good episode, listen to this one. As we all work to try to stick together and survive through this coronavirus thing, I want you to know that I'm thinking about all of you. Do the same thing for each other. Reach out. Tell someone you love them. Take him out to dinner just as soon as we can all safely do so. All right, one other thing. As always, we support Save the Brave. SaveTheBrave.org. Click on the Donate tab. Put a small amount of money in. If you're already doing that, hey, thank you so much. Let me know so I can make sure we thank you openly. I appreciate all of you. And today I'm going to mention a friend of mine, Mark Azevedo, because this episode, as we were recording, I was thinking about him, and I've got a little something special for him. I love the heck out of that guy. and just wanted to say thanks to Mark for all of his support. All right. Here comes David, Rick, and Trent. Get ready. Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay this Moore. This is Greg Proof. This is Jordan Harbinger. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan this East. This is Sebastian Younger. This is Rick Morales. This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mick Gillette. This is Andy Summers. Hey, this is Scott Baxter. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. Hey, my name is Rick Molesky. This is Dave Neese, and you're listening to The Break It Down Show. And now, The Break It Down Show, with John Leon Guerrero and Pete A. Turner. Yes. It's super hard to get that right sometimes. (laughs) We could have a cue card. Yeah. We could wait. Did I say it right? right. Kim didn't didn't put the cue cards out. That was the problem. The Break It Down. Marine's like a good whiteboard. Yes. We got Kim as our production assistant here in Dave's house at his studio with some lovely uh, beverages and popovers that we all passed on because we're trying not to be... Fat. Yeah, fat. <laughs> and obviously uh, Scott Husing, best-selling, award-winning author of Echo and Ramadi is here. And uh, maybe maybe even a guest, another guest after that. But we're here to talk about your guys' documentary, The Gift. Absolutely. Tell us about it. So 15 years ago, roughly, Dave met Jason Dunham on a plane. Yeah, so 15 years ago, I, I took a flight east, and it was a red eye. And I sat next to this young Marine. He had a high and tight. And... We started shooting the shit, and he was just very uh, charismatic and full of energy and just, you know, the kind of person you meet, whether you're at a party or wherever, or at a bar, and you just don't want the night to end. So I thought this kid was really special, and as he left, I looked at him, and, we, you know, we talked about Iraq, he was getting ready to kick off, and I said, you know, take care of yourself, because I figured he'd be gone. He was a Marine from 29 Palms, and... Uh, he just kind of gave me that, and all his Marines described that smile, you know, that shit eating grin he always had. And he said, yeah, no worries, man. And he went on his way. And then flash forward 2004, somebody at work was telling me about this website, iCasualties.org, and it lists all the KIAs from Iraq and Afghanistan. And I went home that night, went down the list, and I saw this one name that kind of jumped out at me. I didn't know, I don't, I didn't remember his last name. I just remember him as Jay. And he said, 29 Palms, Sio, New York, Marine Corporal. So I was like, that kid I met from uh, the plane, he was from 29 Palms. He was 
from upstate New York. So I Googled his name and I hit the images and his picture popped up. And it just, I just felt really, it was like all the blood rushed out of my face or something. And I realized it was him and it was, you know, it sucked, you know, cause he was such a, I just remember this happy, you know, kid with that million dollar smile and all that other stuff. And I sat down and I wrote about meeting him and I posted it on the, the Quezon veterans website because I had a teacher I did a doc on and I went to Vietnam with him. And I know these guys like to listen to stories about other Marines, you know, today. Yeah. So I posted it on there and that, that ended up in his hometown paper. And then his mom called me and I didn't know who it was at first. So I just let it go to voicemail. And then I listened to it and it's, hi, this is Deb Dunham. And I, I read your story about meeting my son and I'd really like to talk to you. And, you know, I didn't know what to do. I was like, do I call her? I, I was like, what am I going to say to her? You yeah. know, what do you say to a parent of, you know, somebody, they lost their son. What am I going to say? So I didn't call her. And a few weeks go by and the phone rings again and I see it's the same number. And I don't answer it. I let it go to voicemail. And I literally sat there on my couch for about a half an hour, you know, telling myself, you know, that I need to call her. And I finally did. I picked up the phone and I called her. And that conversation lasted two hours, mm. you know, with her and her husband. And, and anybody like Trent will attest, these people are just, you know, they're like family when you meet them. You know, they're just those kind of people. And I found my, I, then I was on a, a plane to New York. They invited me up to spend a long weekend with them over the 4th of July. After meeting his parents, I understood why he was the way he was because those people, I mean, they're like a second set of parents to me. You know, I showed up on their doorstep and, and Deb said, you know, well, where's your back? And I said, well, I checked into that little motel in town. And she said, Dan, go get his bags. You're staying here with us. And I was like, wow, you know, and, and I never met him before. Yeah. And that was a Friday by Sunday. It was all hugs and kisses. And, you know, I mean, and that, that was the start of it. And they're just, and that makes it even worse. When you meet somebody like that and then they lose someone, it makes it worse because of how good they are. So now after 15 years, I mean, they're, I'm so close to them now. It, I was on the phone with them yesterday and it's the same every time, you know, I yeah. love you. You know, we'll talk to you soon. They're, it's, they're like, it's like they're parents to me. Yeah. So that's how it started. And, you know, I was going to do a doc back then, but it was more of a, when I met them, I said, you know, when those guys get back, I'm going to uh, sit them down and have them tell good stories about your son because I, I'm an editor and I can do that. I can do that for you. I'm able to do that. So that's what I started to do. And then the news started coming out about what happened and what he did. And it, a lot of the Quezon guys were like, you really need to document this. You should mm. do a documentary on this kid. So I started bringing some of these Kilo guys down here and sat them down. And what are Kilo guys? Kilo, Kilo 37, Kilo Company. That's their third, unit, third Battalion, 7th Marines. Yeah. And I started sitting, and this is, you know, six months after they got back or after it happened, really. So I started sitting them down and it was the hardest, inter and I'd done, you know, interviews with Marines who had fought at Quezon, which was hard, 30 something years after the fact. Yeah. But six months after the fact was extremely hard. And it was just an emotional roller coaster of interviews. It, they just weren't ready. And I, don't, I wasn't ready for something like that, you know? So I kind of put it on the back burner. And, uh, but every year, you know, you start something, you never finish it. But you've been with this family the whole time, going to the White House, you know, for the Medal of Honor ceremony, going to the, to the christening of the ship up in Maine, and going through it, and it's an emotional roller coaster every time. I, for me, it is. I can't imagine what it is for the Marines every time they do it. You know, it's like picking at that scab, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, I went through all this stuff, but in the back of my mind, you're always like, well, you need to finish that thing you, you started. You need to finish it. And every April, on the anniversary of his death, I would say that to myself, like, you know, today's the 22nd, right? You know, this is the day he died. When are you going to finish that? And, you know, Rick, who I moved out to California, we're both former Navy guys. We sat down a year and a half ago. 
about. Yeah, about you. Yeah, you know, yeah. We're, we work for, we've worked for other people our whole lives, you know, telling their stories or getting paid to tell their stories. And we both complain about it, you know, like we need to do our own thing. Yeah. So we started coming up with ideas about veteran stuff with, with some people we know. And then Rick said, well, what about Jason Dunham? Why don't, what about that story? And I was like, you want to do that? And he's like, yeah, let's, I think it's a great story. And I always thought it was a great story, but, and I use this as an analogy in another person I talked to. It's, it's like a chef who makes food all the time and he's so close to it. Yeah. You don't know if it's a good story. Mm. Right. So I, I really didn't know because you're so close to it, but thank God, Rick is my other. Right. So he sends me this drive, you know, and again, we're we're looking for a project to work on together for however many years that we've been out here and we went to college together or whatever. And uh, I had been doing a lot of documentary work most recently over the past 10 years. And, you know, just knowing what it takes to tell a story like this, the story itself, of course, you know, being a good story, but just the footage that he had collected after all, all these years, you know, going to the dedication of the USS Jason Dunham, the Medal of, the on Medal of Honor ceremony, um, just these original interviews he got with these guys um, back in, what was it, 04? 04. 04. Yeah, 04, and Deb and Dan, and just having access to all this is just, and it's just how close these guys are. It's amazing, you know? Yeah. So, and he has such a personal connection, and that came across in those even he just met those guys, but they're so willing to talk to him, you know? And so just knowing what it takes to put one of these things together, um, it was a no brainer. I'm like, this is like one of the greatest stories. What I've makes the story so great? And for listeners, they need to understand there's also a book called The Gift of Valor written by Mike Phillips. Uh, phenomenal. And I listened to it on tape when I was a student in Quantico telling Jason's story of heroism and, and that of his family. And then again, 15 years removed, we have as we were talking about before the show, it's like, how do we all know each other? And yeah. Yeah. Crazy connections. And uh, we could sit here and bore each other to playing the name game. But what is it about Jason's story that makes it so much different than the thousands of other veteran stories um, that have been killed in action or been awarded high medals. I want to take that question because it's perfect. But we also have Trent, who's Jason's commander at the time. Will you grab a mic and sit in here with us and kind of tell us the story? Because that's a perfect question for you too, like what made him special and, and how did that go? So it started in October of 03. I'd taken command of Kilo in Karbala, Iraq in at the end of May, uh, beginning of June 03. Just after I graduated Expeditionary Warfare School, I flew over to Iraq and took over Kilo. I spent three months in country with him in, in Karbala at the end of OAF-1, in which, during which you know, the invasion kicked off in March, and then combat operations eventually scaled down to the point that there was this general feeling that the war had been won. 3-7 came out in... They left country in September, end of August uh, of 03. We were the second last battalion out. So September for us was a 30-day post-deployment leave period. And during that deployment, Rudy, the guy who's just here, my XO, he mm -hmm. was standing uh, battalion officer of the day one day during that leave period block and he called me up the day he was on duty and he said hey so we just got 30 something marines from three four one of our sister battalions uh they just got dropped to us apparently they're too short to deploy with three four again don't know exactly what that means why they're coming to us because there was no word that we were going back yet so we got these 30 something new ncos from three four and so when we came back from our post deployment leave block, that first day back, we had a company formation at the end of the day. So I wanted to welcome those seven new NCOs to the company. So we had a formation, uh, we're standing in a school circle. I welcomed those seven NCOs to the Kilo family and said, for certain, you got it. 
and grabbed those seven NCOs and I brought, they're all corporals, <clears throat> brought them over to talk to him. I stood there in the ditch next to the barracks in Torn Iron Palms. And I needed something important to say to him because they had just come to our fucking family. So I thought back to what I had told Kilo, the dad took over in, in Karbala. And I told him I believe in three things. I said, I, I believe in leadership by example. I believe in self-sacrifice for the gr greater good. And I believe that one man can make a difference. I said, that's what you should expect from me. And that's what I'm going to fucking expect from you. And one of those Marines was Jason Dunham, a fucking machine gunner from Kilo 3-4. His platoon commander had been one of my students at IOC. You know, it's extremely small world. That was October. Two months later, we find ourselves after we've just found out that we're going back in late February, early March. So we had five months back in Conus before we returned. We were the first battalion to return to Iraq for OAF2. And we were in the middle of one of two battalion level training exercises that we were going to have before we went back. And it was the second week of December and we were three days from leaving on our two week Christmas leave block slash pre-deployment leave. And so we're, it was Wednesday, we're in the middle of this five day training exercise that one seven was facilitating for us doing station training for the types of missions that we were expecting squads and platoons to get in a stability and security operations environment, which was we were expecting to go back to, which was all bullshit because we're just going to be fucking straight up counterinsurgency. Anyway, so we're going through the training and it was, it was the afternoon on Wednesday and my first sergeant comes out of me and says, hey, sir, we're getting 33 boots tomorrow from SOI. They're coming, actually, they're coming in tonight. And I was like, you fucking excuse me? <laughs> they're, tonight? We were getting 33 new Marines. Where the fuck did this? And he's like, sir, you know, don't shoot their messenger. I just, I just found out from the sergeant major, you know, so don't drop my head off. All right, you're right, for sergeant. Got it. Okay. So Why is getting 33 new Marines bad? Just real briefly. Not bad, but holy fuck, we're in the middle of a goddamn training exercise and no one, we had no clue that they were even coming. Right. So that's something you want to plan for is, is getting a third of the volume of manpower you currently have. So we had 90 something Marines that were <clears throat> combat veterans that we were going to deploy with. Eventually we deployed with 122 trigger pullers. Right. And so, yeah, 33 of those guys are brand new. And by the way, they're showing up tonight and <laughs> surprise. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, it's, Who's got extra blankets? It's, typ it's typical. <laughs> it's typical Marine Corps. So, you know, when you expect it to happen, it's easier to smile when it does. But I wouldn't smile on that day. I, I was pissed off. But I had to figure out how we're going to do what we're going to do with these guys, because our platoons were all different sizes. When OAF one, before it even ended, before I even got there in I in Iraq, uh, the battalion had dumped like 200 something NCOs to either permanent change of station orders or EAS, you know, end of active service. So the battalion had hemorrhaged fucking leadership. So the, the platoons were different sizes, right? And I, if I recall, Kilo 2 was about 20 Marines at that point. Uh, you know, a, a TO freaking platoon is 41 right. Marines and officers and one officer. Uh, so <laughs> Kilo two had about 20 Marines, Kilo three had about 25. And I knew that if I just topped all the platoons off at 30, that overnight Kilo two would be twice as inexperienced as Kilo three. Cause it'd have 10 boots. Whereas Kilo three would only have five. Right. Mm. And that's not a situation you want to go into combat with one platoon twice as inexperienced as the other. And we had a, an imbalance in combat experience and imbalance in NCO leadership. So we had three factors there. Plus, one of the most compelling factors was my weapons platoon, which I was never happy with in the three months I was in, in Karbala at the end of OIF-1 because it was an awkward organization for a unconventional environment, right? You, you've got four platoons in the company 
And so you're constantly under this manpower management cycle that you're trying to manage to get Marines on a mission, but make sure the Marines that are coming up on the next mission have fucking slept at least a few hours so they can fucking go do that mission that they're coming up on. And by the way, you've got perimeter security to worry about, and you've got local security patrols to worry about, never mind the deep patrols. And Weapons Platoon was just poorly organized for that because it's it's not it's a conventional offensive and defensive type organization but if weapons platoon was going on a patrol in Karbla, they had to give up their machine guns and borrow a rifle from some marine in first platoon right but then when i got there and i put machine guns on most of the fucking posts on our on our defense that require a school trained machine gunner to stand behind it. You know, those guys only live in weapons platoon. So when Kilo one is on perimeter security, they don't have any organic machine gunners. Right. Right. So then you got to rape weapons platoon. So first platoon can stand post. It's just a, and it's, it's a freaking nightmare. It made no sense. So I thought, well, if I've got all these issues going on, I've got experience, imbalance i've got leadership imbalance i've got new blood imbalance and i've got this weird weapons platoon organism that i'm not happy with i need to do something but time is short because we after friday when we all go on leave for two weeks we come back on the second of january to march air force base to kick off our last battalion level training exercise and then it's turn your fucking gear in and get ready to fucking deploy Right. But which is not a lot of time to get anything done. <laughs> no, no. Let, let let alone start thinking about how the company's organized. We can figure an entire company right? out. But despite all of the the issues with it, I finally concluded that the right thing to do was simply reorganize the entire company. So I, I put the word out that this is what was going to happen. And then I started immediately getting <clears throat> negative feedback from the NCOs. And they had a legitimate reason to mm-hmm. kick back on that. And, and to the man, it was unit cohesion. Sir, we all fucking did the march up. We spent this much time in country. We've all, we all fucking know each other. And you're going to break up my fucking team when we're going back to combat? They were not happy with it. And it, it's, a, it's a compelling reason. It makes good sense. But it was not the most important reason to not reorganize. And I, I knew that there was going to be a troop-to-task challenge mm-hmm. during our return. And I needed maximum flexibility in the fucking company. And if I had 12 equally capable rifle squads that could perform any fucking mission that was called upon them without raping another fucking platoon to do it, that that would be the smartest way to go about it. So I got to the first sergeant and I said, first sergeant, I want you to dump the company in a pile. We're going to hold a draft. I want you to print off a fucking roster of every Marine from sergeant on down. And we only had two sergeants in the company. So it was you know, a dozen something corporals and all the rest are lance corporals and blow. And kilo one is going to get first pick, first round. Kilo two, second pick, first round. Kilo four gets fourth pick, first round. Hmm. And in order to make it fair, second round, kilo four will get first pick. Thank it. And kilo one will get fourth pick, right? So tomorrow morning, pull in the platoon commanders and, and have a fucking draft. And at the time... The, we only had two officer platoon commanders, Dave Fleming and Jason Johnson, Kilo 1 and Kilo 2. Kilo 3 was Staff Sergeant Adam Walker, and Kilo 4 was Staff Sergeant John Ferguson. And the two guys who took it seriously were the two Staff Sergeants. And so Ferg spent the whole damn night prior up going over this roster, soup to fucking nuts, looking at all the possibilities of how this draft could shake out. But prioritizing his draft picks. So the next day he chose in the fourth pick, first round, Corporal Travis Drucker, a wrestler from Iowa. And then 
on first pick, second round, was a machine gunner, Corporal Jason Dunham, someone who everyone in the company had seen in the past two months perform at an unusual level, despite the fact that he was not a combat veteran. He'd come from a, another unit, right? So there's that, you're an outsider factor, but he just gave a shit. And everyone could tell that he fucking gave a shit. So he had this leadership potential as well as some exhibited leadership skills that the Marines in the, the unit, the leadership, they, they fucking valued. And John Ferguson valued it highly enough to make him, Jason Dunham, his fucking second pick yeah. out of all the other leadership in the company. And the fact that he wasn't a fucking rival squad leader, he never held a fucking billet like rival squad leader. And at the end of the day, when you look at the at the organization of those platoons after the draft was complete, and you look at the personality of them, the, the personality of those platoons are a direct reflection of those the men who made the picks. So Kilo 4, John Ferguson, quiet, unassuming leader, not a yeller, just a fucking solid guy. Travis Struker, Jason Dunham, Sean Gibson, all three of those cats, quiet guys. They're not yellers. They're fucking solid. They know their shit. And they're just they're just fucking good people. Yeah. Right? They're just good Marines. They're not fucking standouts, but they're fucking they're good. You know, they're they're not the guys who, who draw attention to themselves, but they're fucking solid. And that and then their platoon commander, Brian Robinson who came in to us late, just right out of IOC. He's a tall, unassuming guy. They nicknamed him Bull because he was like Bull from Night Court, <laughs> right? In, in demeanor, <laughs> all the way, and, and, and stature. So that, that platoon had a definite personality, and then that personality was a product of John Ferguson. And so that's how Dunham wound up as a platoon commander. or I'm sorry, as a squad leader. And then... Our first month in country, I had to give them up. I gave up two fucking platoons. Hmm. Uh, Lima Company under Rick Gannon, rest his soul, was was the battalion main effort up at the at the border um, town of Huseba. It was the westernmost edge of our zone. And <laughs> Tank Colonel Lopez said, hey, Captain Gibson, you're fucking giving up two platoons for your first month zone and you'll get one of those platoons back after we've been there for a month uh, roger that sir now you knew exactly how the team leaders and squad leaders felt when the when the colonel is now saying you got to break up your team <clears throat> you're yeah. like wait that's a shitty idea and you were just hearing that from you know the corporals and sergeants and what's important too to remind people is when you say corporals and sergeants or even staff sergeants like adam walker who's a dear friend of mine corporals 20 years old in charge of 13 other lives. Staff Sergeant Walker at the time, probably 28, 29 years old. Yeah. In charge of 30 lives. Yeah. And it, that, that, when you look back, and you, you and I are getting a little gray in our beard now, too, is, uh, you know, you, you really wonder, how do they do it? You know, and then you look at a guy like Dunham, who the, the, the gift in this whole film is about, aside from the fact that he exhibited leadership traits through his actions, I mean, We've talked about this, me and Dave. Physically, he's built like a fucking superhero. And how could you not have a bromance on an airplane ride with Jason? I mean, the guy was a good-looking kid. He was... He's all-American. Yeah, he was just... He's all-American. Yeah, just just built like a superhero. And everything about him oozed, I want to follow that guy. Yeah, yeah. No, I said he wasn't a standout. And the scholars were standouts. Not in the typical Marine type way, right? The outgoing, brash, loud, in your face type guy. But standouts nonetheless in fucking basic mm -hmm. leadership, right? Just being the kind of guy that yeah. other Marines are going to emulate because mm -hmm. they want to be like him because he treats them with fucking respect. And, that, and that, that's what made him yeah. not unique not special, but that's what made him special to the Marines in his fucking squad, right? On the 13th of April, the night before that fateful mission, 
he's writing his operations order for the next day. And to put it all in context, they had, Kilo 4 had just come back to me a couple weeks earlier. And their entire time, while they were with Lima Company, they were operating on a platoon level. Every time they went in zone, it was an entire platoon together, three squads, right? Brian Robinson led every fucking patrol as the platoon commander, therefore the patrol leader. Everything was platoon level for Lima Company in their zone. Kilo Company didn't have that fucking luxury. I had two goddamn platoons I was trying to hold down a fucking six kilometer long zone with. And so we operated on squad level. That was the only way you could skin that cat was with a single rifle squad at a time. So when 10 Colonel Lopez came to me and said, hey, Captain Gibson, tomorrow we're going in zone and we're going to the Crabble Police Station and I'm bringing uh, the first two weeks of pay to the Crabble Police Department for their new policeman that we just created out of whole cloth at the police academy that my attached MP platoon just ran for these guys. I'm going in zone tomorrow. And we're going to pay the police chief to put these guys to work. And you're going in there. You're going to reconnoiter a patrol base for a 48-hour or 96-hour, four-day patrolling operation. And we just taught these guys their basic skills. And what I want is for four days straight, these guys to patrol alongside Marines day and night doing what they were just trained to do. I want the people of Crabla to see their police force at work. So make it happen and I'll see you in zone tomorrow. And so the platoon next up in the rotation was Kilo 4. So I, I grabbed Robinson. I said, get me in zone tomorrow with a fucking squad at, you know, zero nine, whatever. We're, we're meeting the fucking battalion commander at the Crabble police station. So he grabbed Dunham and assigned him the mission to lead that patrol into Carabola. And it wouldn't just be his squad, it would be his squad, plus all the Marines that were getting us into zone, they were manning those fucking Humvees, right? Plus the company commander and all the other strap hangers that we were gonna take with us. So Dunham was all, all of a sudden going from being a squad leader in a platoon sized patrol to being the patrol leader of 25 something Marines. So he had a lot of fucking weight on his shoulder, just like that. Yeah. And he spent all day getting his Marines ready for the fucking mission. And he, come midnight, uh, there's three Marines in the COC. It's myself, my radio operator, Cresswell, on the radio, and fucking Dunham at this goddamn picnic table, writing his order. Utes and boots, no shirt because it was fucking hot. Bare chested, sitting there writing out his five paragraph order. And it was midnight, which meant that the the damn mess platoon had put out mid rats, midnight rations, for mostly for the Marines in India Company that were performing perimeter security for the battalion FOB and in walk two of Dunham's Marines his two fire team leaders, Lance Cole Bill Hampton and Lance Cole Josh Carbajal. And they had a fucking plate of chow on a cardboard tray, you know, fucking tray rat eggs and a fucking slice of hammers. And he looks up and he says, what's this? And both these guys were combat veterans from OAF-1, you know, and they had both held an initial sense of resentment against Dunham being assigned as their squad leader because he didn't have combat experience, you know? And so that was the, the chest thumping touchstone at that point, you know, I was all F1 and you weren't. They quickly figured out that, that he was a fucking leader mm. and that it didn't matter whether he had combat experience or not because he was just a good fucker. So he said, what's this? And, and, and Hampton says, uh, well, you've been taking care of us all day and we know you haven't had time to even eat chow, you want to make sure uh, you at least got something. So we thanked him, and I sat there and I watched that. 
and I realized I was seeing something I had never fucking seen before. At the basic school, as an officer, you go through a six-month course, and you learn from these Marine captains who've been there and done that. And more than the tactics that are throughout that whole six-month period, above all, the one, the one thread that runs through that entire curriculum is leadership, right? And, and I remember one of my instructors talking about a true leader, you'll know it when you see his Marines taking care of him. Like if, if you're, as a platoon commander, if you're a good fucking platoon commander, you won't need to dig your own fighting hole in the defense. Your Marines will see that you've got so much other shit on your plate and you're, you're fucking do it. They're going to take care of right. you and, and dig your fighting hole for you. And so I had this image in my head that, you know, maybe someday I'd see that. And, and, and there it was <laughs> right in front of me. And to me, it may sound corny, but what I was seeing in that moment was those two Marines placing a crown on his fucking head and saying, you're our leader. I realized in that moment that 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 title isn't something that anyone else can give you. That you could have seniors say, hey, he's a good leader. Your peers could think you're a good leader. But the only ones who can actually bestow that title upon you Mm -hmm. are the ones you know shit lead. And I saw that happen, and I, I felt like I was just a, a fucking quiet witness to it behind a plate of glass or something. You know, you, I saw it unfold in front of me, and I, I didn't really. It was surreal that it was happening right there in front of me. And then Carbajal and, and Hampton walked out, and Dunham went back to write his order. <laughs> And I thought, man, I should take a fucking photo of him. And I had this computer or this goddamn camera, you know, a little digital camera that the battalion S2 gave out, you know, one to each company for intel purposes. Damn SSE sensitive site exploitation after contact or whatever. And, and it was in my fucking flack. And I thought I should get up and take a photo of him. And I was fucking smoked. I was exhausted and I, I didn't get up. I didn't take that fucking photo, but I sat there and I, I, I just, I watched him and I thought to myself, what would I ever do if I lost a, a fucking Marine? You know, someone who's just so, such a genuine leader that his guys are bringing him fucking chow to make sure that he's taken care of. But I didn't get up. And then the next morning, we rolled out at 08. And the, the first thing that every patrol at that point was doing before we left the fucking battalion wire was we would conduct a, a rehearsal for react to enemy contact. We had lost our first Marine five days prior to that on the 9th of April. PFC Elias Torres was killed in a kilometer long ambush in the village of Sada, which was the, I had Crabble and Sada in my zone and Sada was on the east, Crabble was on the west. And he was killed because, uh, for a couple of reasons, but, but one of them was that we hadn't been anticipating that type of contact and the need to be able to respond to it. So after losing Torres on the 9th, I mandated that every single fucking patrol that left the goddamn wire would rehearse, a no shit fucking rehearsal, react to enemy contact before they left the wire. And so it was also Dunham's first time to rehearse that battle drill. So as we approached the wire, I called over the radio, contact right, and... Vehicle stopped, Marines jumped out, they did their thing. And there were some things they screwed up. So I called the leaders up on me, Dunham, his fire team leaders, the gun truck leaders, and the vehicle commanders. We talked about the things that needed to be fixed. And Dunham realized that it hadn't shaken out the way he wanted 
to, you know, that the battle jewel didn't go the way it was supposed to. And he had those fucking Wiley X goggles on. He had this look of disappointment in his face. You could see in his eyes. He, he felt like he had let me down. And I could see it. So I slapped him on the shoulder and I said, that's right. We'll fix it. You know, we got a job to do. Let's fucking go. So we got out there, linked up with Colonel Lopez, and he did his thing. And then we went over behind the police station and started reconnoitering uh, this prospective patrol base for that 96-hour patrolling operation with Iraqi police. It was a water treatment plant. It, was, it had it had been under construction, but at some point um, in its lifetime had stopped being built. So it was, it was a really good compound with like 12 foot high walls around the whole thing and, and several buildings on the interior. And I'd brought Stats Sergeant Ferguson as the platoon sergeant for Keto 4 because Keto 4 for that upcoming mission, they were going to be perimeter security. And so I wanted him to get eyes on exactly what he was going to be defending as, as the perimeter security platoon. So we went behind the police station, we got into the water treatment plant and there was, there was an Iraqi family who was squatting in the headquarters building of that treatment plant. So we, we bypassed them, excused ourselves, and, and, and went up top to the roof to get a good eye on things. And I hadn't been up there for long, and, and we heard some explosions to our west towards Lima Company's position. And Lima Company had been getting hit straight for two weeks. Uh, they'd been getting mortared every day with 60 millimeter mortars. And Dunham comes running up the fucking stairs up to the roof. And I looked at him, I said, what do you think? And he says, I think Lima's getting hit. I said, well, let's go get those motherfuckers. He thought that, you know, finally, for the first time in two weeks, right, someone was outside the fucking wire in a position that the Mooj probably wasn't expecting. And so we had a chance to get those bastards. So I said, get, get the fucking squad on the move. And we had gun trucks and two high back Humvees that got us in the zone and they were satelliting around us. At the time, they weren't right there where we were. So we got outside of that compound and just started running west down the MSR towards the sound of the fucking, the explosions. The radio operator Sanders from Oklahoma, Jason Sanders got a hold of the trucks and vectored them back to us. So they came screeching to halt. We jumped on and started pushing west. And then so once we were in the trucks, then I had a battalion radio net that I could hear and we figured out that it wasn't Lehman Company getting hit. It was actually the battalion commander's patrol that had been fucking hit on their way to Lehman Company's position. Right at the boundary between my zone and Lehman Company's zone. And about the time we figured out over the radio traffic that it was a fucking ambush on the battalion commander's patrol, a fucking RPG flies over the goddamn Vic in front of me, right over fucking Lance Global Carver Hall's head. So we knew we had, we had arrived, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> no need to figure out anything more on the fucking net. Sahlin was Sahlin, yes. <clears throat> so, so we got out of the trucks and got up against the wall. And that spot we were at was a triangular-shaped village at the western edge of my zone, right up against a wadi that delineated the eastern edge of Lima Company's zone. And it was just this triangular shaped village that was populated mostly by shepherds and it was half unpopulated anyway. So it was, it was, it was prime place to fucking set up shop if you wanted to hit someone because it wasn't really an occupied urban area. As it turns out, the vast majority of contact we got in that time frame was in the HK. And the, it was the first place I saw contact two or three weeks earlier, God no, a month earlier, when I was there on advance party 
with the other company commanders and company gunnies in the battalion before the battalion proper even got there. Our first time out the wire, we got ambushed in the HK. And the army unit that we were with was a self-propelled unit that was organic to the first of the third, or maybe attached to the first of the third cav. Uh, that was the army cavalry squadron that we replaced. And they were the only unit in that squadron, in that battalion that was mounted in Humvees. Everyone else is in Bradleys and tanks. So they were the closest to a straight leg grunt you could get. And they fucking immediately called uh, a damn battle drill audible, cordoned off the fucking village and then swept through it and killed one mooge and captured two others just like that. So I'd seen the battle drill already. So I told Dunham, I said, hey, get the fucking trucks on the south and we're going to sweep north north to south. So set up the cordon and then we'll fucking sweep into them. He said, all right, you go with Carbajal and I'm going with Hampton. Roger that. So Hampton's fire team with Dunham and... Ferg, the platoon sergeant, and a scout sniper, and some other cats and dogs that were attached to the patrol that day, they swept the eastern half of the HK. And I went with Carbajal, and we started sweeping on the western half. And we got to a certain point where we wound up, Carbajal and I, the team I was with, we wound up clearing to a certain point, and then wound up on the western edge overlooking the wadi. And... Okay. Then we heard small arms firing to back to the east. And we looked to the southeast and we saw civilian vehicles backing up out of this road, hell bent for election, trying to get the fuck out of way of something. So myself and Carbajal and our Arab hating, atheistic, Kurd linguist by the name of Sam, who is just pure fucking money. We ran over there, stopped those vehicles, checked them. They were going to a fucking wedding. Sam's like, sir, these guys are good. So we let him go. And then we started pushing down the street that they had been coming up. And we saw a Marine and it was Sergeant Reynolds, who was one of our attached scout snipers. I brought him along so he could re reconnoiter some scout sniper um, hides for the patrolling operation. And he yelled at me down the street to that there was a white pickup um, that we need to find a fucking white pickup. It had gone south. So we pushed south all the way to this railroad track that ran across a berm that delineated the southern edge of the HK. And we got there and there there was we couldn't find a fucking pickup. But at that time um several of my Humvees from Cat White came screaming out of Huseba from our west uh into the HK past us. And we didn't have com with and we had shit for com at the time. So Carbajal got up on a three-story building in another water treatment plant that we wound up using months later as a patrolling base. And uh, he got comms with Hampton's fire team. But I think he was talking to Ferg. He must have been talking to Ferg because Hampton was was wounded and evacuated by then. By the time we got to him, those, those Humvees that had come racing up, they were evacuating Dunham, Miller, and Hampton. We didn't know any of that. So we worked our way back to where Ferg was. So we finally, we approached that same road, but from the south and we, we got on site and there were several vehicles. Actually, there was only one vehicle left in the road. It was a white total Land Cruiser. All the fucking doors were open. There were several weapons, AKs, RPGs stacked against the fucking wall on the south side of that dirt road. And uh, Ferg saw me show up, so he came over and he just 
he just, he didn't fucking wait for a question or anything. He said, hey, Miller and Hampton are going to be okay. And there's something about the way he said Miller and Hampton are going to be okay that told me that someone wasn't fucking okay. I said, what the fuck are you saying? He says, it's dumb. So I did another unpopular thing and I told Fur, we got to finish clearing out the fucking rest of the village. So, I mean, the Marines were smoked by that point, but they fucking did it anyway. And they cleared out the rest of the village and they, they got a couple of guys that they deemed to be suspicious and, and we detained them. And there was a, a fucking dead mooj in the goddamn road. I started checking things out to try and piece together what happened. And while I was looking things over, Ferguson was telling me his perspective on what had happened. I noticed a, a piece of yellowish green Kevlar on the deck. It was just a little tiny scrap. And then I looked up against the wall where the row of those weapons were leaned up against the wall, AKs, RPGs. There was a a fucking piece of Kevlar up against the wall. And I I picked it up and I was looking at it and I first thought I just assumed that it was a piece of Kevlar from a Humvee door. Because the armored Humvees armored on the inside doors of Kevlar, right? And around St. Patty's Day, if not on, on St. Patty's Day, the battalion had taken its first casualties. We lost two Marines in a fucking rear roll mine strike. Not even Fuck, not even a kilometer from where we were, several hundred meters to our west, at the western edge of the HK, just above that fucking wadi. A Humvee from uh, Cat Red had, I believe it was Cat Red, had hit a, hit a fucking mine, but on the rear wheel. Flipped the fucking vehicle, killed the Marine on top of that, who's riding that fucking seat above that wheel immediately, and killed, I think PFC Smith was his name, was the gunner. Let's fucking float the vehicle upside down. And several days later, Staff Sergeant Lassiter, Cat White Platoon Sergeant, on a patrol on Route Diamond, which was, there were two MSRs that ran through our zone. Jade was a southern one, Route 12, that ran from fucking Damascus to Baghdad, right? And then there was a frontage road, one kilometer to the north was Diamond. And they rolled up two fucking moves in a goddamn BMW with pistols, a GPS with grids, in our fucking battalion firm base and PFC Smith's ID card. So we knew they were scrubbing the fucking sites, right? And so I thought that this maybe this was just a piece of Kevlar from that mine strike. And then I'm, I'm looking at it and I, I realized that it had a familiar shape to it and it was the fucking ear scoop on the goddamn Kevlar helmet. And I realized I was holding a piece of a fucking Kevlar helmet. And I turned to Ferg and I said, where's Dunham's helmet? And he called over his Marines to grab Dunham's gear because they had taken, they kept Miller, Hamptons, and Dunham's gear and weapons when they, when they Kazi backed him. And they went through their shit and said, it ain't here. And I was looking across this 12, 15 foot wide dirt road, right? And I realized it was covered in tiny fucking scraps of Kevlar. It it was probably covering a 20 square meter area, tiny pieces of Kevlar. So, you know, this realization is dawning on us collectively. And I told Ferg, I said, let's get this shit picked up. I want every fucking scrap of this shit picked up. It sickened me to present the enemy with any fucking scrap of evidence that they could they could get to us. I didn't want them to see that they could fucking hurt us. So one of the Marines had a couple of two-gallon Ziploc bags in his butt pack. And so he pulled it out and they filled these two fucking Ziploc bags with Kevlar. It was like four fucking gallons of Kevlar scraps. And I just assumed that Dunham had been facing the fucking grenade when it went off. 
and that it had blown his helmet apart. But a couple days later, when I was I was in the fourth platoon area where they where their racks were, and I was sitting on a cot next to Sanders, talked to him about he was doing how he was doing, and Ferg was there. And Sanders told me this story two weeks or maybe a month before that. They were still in, in Lima Company's position. There had been this conversation that Kilo 4 had while they're on a break between patrols. And the inevitable question comes up, you know, what do you do with a fucking live grenade? You know, I mean, you look at the fucking Medal of Honor book that's thicker than the fucking Bible and easily half the citations in there are, are goddamn Marines and soldiers who've covered fucking grenades to save their buttons. So the question had come up and, and Dunham apparently had this theory that you could cover it with your fucking Kevlar. And because it was designed to protect the wearer from the outside, you know, from small arms fire and fragmentation, that, that you could diffuse the blast of a grenade by covering it with a fucking Kevlar. I guess Dunham and, and Ferg and, and Robinson and I, I, a couple of the Marines were, were having this conversation and Dunham proposed his theory and Lieutenant Robinson said, well, you know, a grenade's got a three to five second fuse. There's no way you're getting, you're getting a fucking helmet on top of a grenade before it goes off. And Dunham says, really? And he stepped off and he came back with his fucking helmet on and he looked at Lieutenant Robinson, and he said, time me. So Bull grabbed his G-Shock, and he fucking hit the timer. And within a second, Dunham had tilted his head forward and slapped the fucking helmet on the deck. And Bull's like, fuck. And Ferg says, well, you know, it's still going to fuck you up. And Robinson says, well, maybe the best thing to do is maybe cover it and then get your, get your sappy play, you know, your fucking body armor on top of it too. Maybe that would be the best thing to do. So I'm listening to, to goddamn Sanders tell me this fucking story. And, and it, it dawned on me, he wasn't, he didn't have his helmet on when the fucking grenade went off. He covered the goddamn thing. Because there's just no way that if it had been on his head that, you know, his head wouldn't have been fucking blown apart instead of the helmet. Which... Had, hadn't occurred to me there in the HK that shitty day. And uh, I walked right out of there and I walked right over to the fucking battalion CP and walked into the colonel's office and I told 10 Colonel Lopez what Sanders had just told me. And Lopez looks at me and he said, write it up. And I left. I went back. 10 Robinson up. I know you've only been a platoon commander for four fucking months and you're a second lieutenant, but you're about to write a fucking Medal of Honor citation. So Bull sat down and started writing it, and, and Rudy helped him with it. And that was how it happened. That may have gone a little bit afield from what your original question was. I wouldn't change a word of it. Yeah, that's powerful. But that's the context of it all. So the, the final answer was he does jump on this grenade with the Kevlar first. I actually remember when this happened um, because I was in Iraq at Baghdad, waiting to go up north of Missoula. And I remember because mm. the, uh, the four contractors got hung off the bridge yeah. around that time too. And it was it was crazy over there where you guys were. Yeah. They actually wanted to send us over there. Like, can you guys just go over and help over there, you know, for a little while on your soft-sided Toyotas? And, you know, <laughs> we're like, uh, help? Like, is yeah. it, like, are you assigning us to go over there or are we just helping? Yeah, what are we going to do? <laughs> yeah. And then no patrols would go that way with us because it was just, they're like, hell no. Like, so I'm trying to get some context to the audience and how dangerous that area was during that time. Even mm -hmm. like just even far uh, west as uh, Abu Ghraib to go do anything mm -hmm. was, was really dicey back then. So I totally remember this whole thing where, where he covers it and yeah, jumped on it. That's, that's crazy. Yeah. And that, well, the, the whole damn province just went to hell in a handbasket on the ninth of fucking April. Fucking Ramadi. Yeah. Al Qaim, all of it. Hundreds of foreign fighters had infiltrated across the Syrian border, set up shop, and they were there to fucking fight. Yeah. They were there to fight. That's it. There, were, there was no, 
hey, we're going to fucking, you know, attack these Americans with some IEDs. They were there to fucking fight. The first fight we had was that night that Torres was killed on the night. And they initiated with an IED to stop the fucking patrol. And they opened up. And in my estimation, it was no shit a fucking kilometer wide, Hmm. that ambush. And there had to have been 40 to 50. And that was just one side of it. They were in a double-sided ambush. Two back-to-back ambushes. One oriented south on Jade, and the other one was oriented north on Diamond. And both, I had two fucking squads get hit. Kilo 4-1 got hit by the north combat, by the northern ambush element, and they fucking did what Marines are supposed to do, which is attack through the fucking ambush. They cleared it out. They killed one guy in the process, and they called up 3-3, who had just passed them going west to drop off a fucking patrol at the western end of Carabola. And Stassarant Lot, the split section leader for that cat section that was carrying 3-3 into zone, he got the fucking call from the beast. Corporal Jack Self from Texas was the uh, vehicle commander who called to fucking Stassarant Lot. And uh, he said, hey, we got him on the fucking move. We're pushing him south. We cleared him out. Fucking cut him off. Hmm. And Stassarant Lot thought finally finally because we've been over there getting hit with ieds no fucking direct contact not even seeing the fucking enemy right so the, when you get a chance to fucking get in a fight a no shit face-to-face fight you know that's that's what you've been waiting for and so lot punched east and he left kilo three three behind so his only dismounted firepower that, that rifle squad, he left, and they fucking flew east and ran square into a kilometer-long ambush mm. with no way to fucking fight back except just shoot back from your own fucking vehicle. Mm. And that we lost PFC Torres in that. He was a, a goddamn radio operator turned driver turned fucking rifleman who had kicked open his fucking door Every time they bound another 200 meters to set up a base of fire to let the other two vehicles bound ahead, you know, in a fucking classic break contact drill. They were on their last bound out of the kill zone. And Torres was opening his fucking door to to the ambush. Nothing between him and enemy fire but fucking thin air. And he caught a fucking RBK burst to the face. Talk to me about what your decision process was is from a leadership standpoint when you're standing there with Colonel Lopez and he says, write it up. They said, write up a Medal of Honor. Was that your decision? He didn't say, it, it was understood. Hmm. You, you knew, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it, There's not many Medal of Honor recipients from this war. We could go down that rabbit hole about how broken our award system is, which we've talked about a little on previous shows and in the sidelines, but how do you make that decision when one guy does one thing and other guys are casualties and die fighting for the same brothers you're standing right next to to make that one singular decision say because there's there's no criteria there's no textbook that says right. you have to do this yeah. but yeah. you pick that one guy and there hadn't been one for what 40 years yeah since, since Vietnam. Vietnam since Vietnam since Vietnam no, not, mar- not Marine not a Marine right. the only other yeah. ones were the army guy at the, air- at the airport was fighting out of that Bradley. Yep, starting first class. Yep, mm-hmm. Clark, I think. I don't or remember Smith, anymore. and well, two in Somalia. Somalia, yeah. Uh, tell, tell me, what led you to that decision? How difficult it was to write it, and then the follow-on frustration about getting it approved. Hey, this is Pete A. Turner from Lions Rock Productions. We create podcasts around here. And if you, your brand, or your company want to figure out how to do a podcast, just talk to me. I'll give you the advice on the right gear, the best plan, and show you how to take a podcast that makes sense for you, that's sustainable, that's scalable, and fun. Hit me up at Pete at BreakItDownShow.com. Let me help. I want to hear about it. What led you to that decision? How difficult it was to write it and then the follow-on frustration about getting it approved. It wasn't a difficult decision at all. It was a fucking given. It is, as soon as I understood what really happened, it went without saying 
it was a foregone conclusion that that, that was a Medal of Honor action. Mm-hmm. And, and that's why Lopez didn't have to say anything but write it up. And I, I wasn't even asking for his permission. I, I was telling him, this is what's coming. And I think the most important thing about it for me w- was to have Robinson do it. Um, I eventually, you know, scrubbed the citation before he forwarded up the chain, but Dunham belonged to Robinson, and, and it was Robinson's responsibility to write that. And it didn't matter that he was a second lieutenant sure. with four years in the fleet. You know, that it, not the first second lieutenant to ever have to fucking do that, you know? So it was just a foregone conclusion. It wasn't... It wasn't a difficult thing at all, except the gravity of it, realizing that that you were submitting something that, if it came to fruition, was going to go in the book, you know, the fucking book with all those other citations of men who had given their lives to save their fellow Marines and soldiers. And... Once we launched it, there was a bit of quiet for a while. And then the next question is, okay, well, how do we know that's what happened? Well, we want to see the helmet. Okay. Thankfully, we fucking had it. So we took those four gallons of Kevlar and gave them to the battalion XO, Major Anthony Henderson. And he boxed them up and he had the foresight to write a letter of provenance mm. for the helmet chain of custody <laughs> yeah and he taped it to the outside of the box that said hey these are the remains of corporal jason dumb's kevlar helmet it belonged to third battalion seventh rings this is the day to happen blase blase and then that box got sent up to blue diamond to first mardiv and we never saw it again until 2009, I had just graduated Command and Staff College and I was headed west on I-40 to take over as XO at 27. And I got a call from Deb Dunham and she said, they found it. I said, found what? She said, the helmet. I said, okay. And she said, I don't want to see it. I don't care what you fucking do with it. I don't want to see it. But I trust you to decide what needs to be done. And that's getting off topic. To answer your question, then that it was a long process for that metal to get sure. approved, right? And I remember I was... I was in Buffalo, New York, and I was getting ready to drive down to the Dunham's and the metal had not been approved yet. Or maybe it had, I can't, I can't fucking remember. But I was talking to, at the time, Major General John Kelly, who during 04 was the assistant division commander Mm -hmm. for, for 1st Mardiv under Mattis. And he had called me to give me an update on the on where the metal was in the system. It was I think he was waiting for second nav approval at the time. This is five years later. No, this was I want to say it was it was it was over two years later. I want to say it was in 07. April of four he dies and then it was two, in, two years I think it was later. early 07. Yeah. And I want to say, if, if my memory serves me correctly, I haven't won any awards with it lately, but I'm pretty sure that's it was April 07, and we were headed down to SIO to dedicate the, the goddamn post office. Hmm. The townspeople of SIO were dedicating their post office to Jason Dunham. And so... Deb invited us there for that, and Rudy came, and Dave Fleming came, and, and several other Kilo Marines came, and I think General Magnus uh, came and spoke at that. So but I had just flown into the Buffalo airport. I, was, I got a call from General Kelly, so I pull over to the side of the road. I'm sitting in a fucking parking lot, and 
I've got a, a major general who spent 20 minutes on the phone with me complaining about the Marine Corps award system. <laughs> and I'm, I'm a fucking that young matter. major and I'm like, holy fuck. <laughs> and he, he said something I'll never forget. He put it in stark perspective. He said, do you realize that John Bazalone, in less time than it has taken our nation to decide that Dunham deserves a Medal of Honor. John Bazalone had earned the fucking Medal of Honor, come back stateside, ran a few goddamn war bond drives, yeah. and then gone back and got his ass shot off on fucking Iwo Jima in less time than it has taken us to approve the Medal of Honor for Dunham. Yeah. And this is a computer age. And back then, they were fucking communicating by goddamn ships. <laughs> Ship, telegram. The telegraph, yeah. my yeah. fucking telegraph, <laughs> right? On tr the Trans Pacific yeah. Cable. What the fuck? Yeah, we, we have seen the level of frustration at, at every level. I mean, Mattis writes about it in his book. Kelly's talking to you on the phone about it. Senior level officials have done it. What do you think, since we're talking about it and you're very outspoken, fast forward uh, November of, of that year, Rafael Peralta dives on a grenade and let's let's clear that up too is that there were other marines around jason and he wasn't just testing a theory on a random errant grenade thrown he was saving the lives of those that were around him and he dives on a grenade who does that someone that just instantaneously wants to it's like a mother instinct protecting her kids yeah and that's what they do and then November comes around and there's the same scrutiny put on Sergeant Rafael Peralta about him diving on a grenade to save his Marines. And it's interesting you shared with, with the audience that, uh, you know, the, this forensic set of glasses that our, our military leaders put on to say, well, I need to examine the Kevlar. Was it really a bag of, you know, fluff now torn into ribbon shreds, like, and, and prove that he did that and to question the integrity of, the Marines, the officers that served alongside of him, and then what Peralta did as well. And I was a fraction of that process. I stood in the chief of staff's office at First Mardiv when they found his flak jacket and wanted it sent to NIS in, in D.C. to do this forensic examination. The, the thread got pulled on that, and they would not award the Medal of Honor. And there was water cooler chatter saying, we're no longer going to give the nation's highest award, the Medal of Honor, to people who dive on grenades because that is not a smart tactical thing to do. That's what was being discussed. Are you fucking serious? Oh, I'm, I'm absolutely 100% yeah. uh, accurate on that, and I'm not going to quote anyone on who said that. But the thought of it, makes my blood boil and I will go off the rails if you get me talking about it too much. And I can look at Trent's face too and think it, it's astounding to me. And that's why I asked the question is the, that, that frustration that we all feel as people that, that fight and serve and, and uh, have to explain the actions of these brave young men and women, I think is something that the public really doesn't comprehend aside from everything that goes on. And, and I think the, what we hear from you and what this story, the gift is, is giving audiences ultimately when it gets produced, Dave, is um, it's emblematic. And, and Trent, as a, as, a, as a commander, can understand, like, you write those awards and you'd write them all for all the guys if it, if it was a perfect world. Everyone would get a, a stupid piece of, you know, ribbon and, and a shiny emblem to hang on their chest. But it's really emblematic of what all of those guys did. The other yeah. couple hundred Marines you led that you had to take care of throughout that patrol. And I think for the most part, the majority of the Marines and soldiers that fight understand that as like, yeah, he was one of ours. He did do great things. And I think that this connection with with Deb and, and the rest of the family, that our Gold Star families that bonds us so uniquely is something that it does uh, really bring any hard warrior to tears to think that these people are out there, that they still want to give us this continued love after witnessing and, and experiencing the, the worst part of their entire life is seeing their son die. That's tough. But I think that by sharing this, this film, 
and and all of the people as we sit around these kitchen tables sharing that story we we rope people in like rick and 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 so many others to share it i think the the question i would just leave you with is why is it so important for you to share this those surrounding events when there's been a book written about what he did well for me personally in my opinion you know you kind of touched on it people don't understand or don't realize it goes beyond just the act of he you know jumped on a grenade and killed himself there's all the repercussions that come afterwards that people really don't hear about you know kelly miller and bill hampton you know i mean these are lives who had kids and got married and started their lives and their life continues but it wouldn't have happened you know i look at their we went to a, a podcast all of us a few months back and i couldn't help but sit there and, and stare at kelly's kid jet jet jason miller and i a cute little kid right and you're just looking at him and i'm looking at him and i'm like this kid wouldn't be here because they all would have died yeah. you know and people don't know that part of it yeah. they just know the the glorious oh he dove on a grenade and he sacrificed himself that's so heroic but there's so much more that goes into that afterwards you know all those lives that are affected for the good and the bad there's a lot more good i think that has come of it we're all sitting here because of what he did yeah. you know hmm. we're connected to deb and dan for what he did i'm connected to your father who lives near here for what he did rick and i are connected to this story and i've connected him to all these people and all it's like a spider web that goes out and all these people are connected and it's and it's showing all these good things and some bad that continue to happen i mean a perfect example is is castaneda you know and this text message he sent we released that video on on veterans day the day after we did jocko's podcast and he sent me a text of him with his kids at the school on Veterans Day. And he said, I never would have went to these things in the past because I shied away from that. I didn't want to talk about it. He's the one in the thing that said, you know, I, I just wanted to do my job that day, yeah. but I couldn't. And he, he said, I just want to thank you. I, I just watched that trailer and I wanted to thank you because it made me realize what Jason gave me. And it's these two kids that call me dad. And I read that and I cried because that meant more to me. And it's just something that makes you real. Just me as a person made me realize how important that act has become and what it has done to these guys. And they, and they continue to beat themselves up for it. You know, they all do. But it's just to be able to sit down and talk about it and get it out. I mean, every interview we do, right? It's that was I think my that's first. That's the best answer I could have ever gotten. I mean, yeah. that, that's that type, that's... Of, that type of unsolicited feedback for yeah. what you're doing. I think is is tough. And the other thing, as a storyteller, how do you bring this story to life and, and share those good things that come of it? Because as veterans and guys that are fighting, the public always wants to kind of look with sad eyes and say, oh, we're sorry for your loss and this, and it was so tough. But no, we don't want to be those guys. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be a guy like that. How important is it to share the positive things? When I look at this and you see the the bloody body of some soldier or Marine being loaded on a Kazabak helicopter, you're like, oh, this is, I'm not going to want to watch this. How do you, how do you present that to the public so they want to see all of these things in 90 minutes and give 90 minutes of their lives. Well, I think, you know, when we started out, our whole goal was to help soldiers, Marines, whomever talk about shit. Right. And we we're like, what could we possibly do? And this story was an in as far as you're talking about a selfless, unbelievably like mind boggling heroic act you're talking about the guys who survived and live with the guilt of that survivors right and it's that 
you know, when we started out, it was that saving private Ryan question. Have I been a good man? Did I live a good life? And all these guys struggle with it all the time. And it's, I mean, Dave got a call the other night, you know, we, there's a guy who's like, I'm fucked up again, you know? And it's like, how do we keep a conversation going? That's a healthy conversation, giving something back, like just trying to get your shit out there. And like he said, create a community. And it's more than just like, Hey, there's the business side of it. There's the storytelling side of it. There's whatever. But then it's like all these other people have gotten together and developed relationships and a support system and having a conversation about with like a documentary that tells a story like this gets other guys out there talking, you know, it, 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 it gets people to be like, Hey, like we were talking to somebody the other day and he said he'd lost touch with a buddy of his and, you know, he had a desk job and his buddy went out and went to Afghanistan for six months and he came back and the guy was like this super jovial, fun cat, you know, he came back and he's like, man, he was a sh a sh a, just a shell of himself. Like he couldn't even function and he lost, he's like, I try to call him, I try to do things and I don't get any response, you know? And it's that whole, like, you got to keep calling, right? Yeah. You got to keep just the guy knows you're there. So I got to ask you this not. question. Yeah. The film is by veterans for veterans. Why don't you make the film for the public? Because I understand that these guys need a, a network and a, hey, call me, man, if you're feeling like drinking again and sticking a gun in your mouth. I get that. We know those guys. How important is it to make the film for the public who are the majority of people that don't know about Surgeon Sacrifice that can see a guy who says, oh, that's that guy from the, the Marine Corps tribe. And we're the vast majority of the public that have never served. And to identify those signs or people that are hurting or they're low. I got to ask that question because isn't that important for you when you make a product, when you make a film and you give so much of yourself and you pull emotion from other people to really make it more than that one half of 1% of the American population? Well, absolutely. I mean, like with any project, you know, with any story you want to, like any podcast, you want everybody to be able to connect to it, not just, you don't want to just pigeonhole yourself, right? Sure. And I mean, honestly, it's like, that's just, you know, the idea was let's put guys to work on some shit we can all get behind, you know? And so when you say by veterans for veterans, like, look, I'm not a war fighter. I mean, yeah, I served on an aircraft carrier, you know, during desert storm, but I've never seen, like, I've never been on the boots on the ground or anything like that. But I'm a vet and I want to get a message out there that, hey, it's OK to talk about this shit. Right. I mean, your question is absolutely valid in that asking why we wouldn't want to have other people identify with it. And, but we do, you know, and I guess that's just like in a non cynical way, it's a way for us to sell this thing. Mm -hmm. Right. Like we're not looking for um, Only exclusion, yeah. exclusion. We're looking for inclusion, but it's a way for us to get the community behind it to reach a broader yeah. audience. Right. So I, I think that maybe as you as it's developed, is it the byproduct that it helps veterans, or is the byproduct it helps the public? I think it's both. Yeah. You know, I, 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 my intention from the beginning is to get guys to sit down like this and talk, but it's also to get civilians to look at it in a different light. Like, wow, I never thought of it like that, and you know. Because I mean, the majority of people out there have nothing to do with the military, right? So it's, and I use that analogy, or I don't know if you call it an analogy, but you know, after, after watching this, I would hope that a civilian, because you always hear that, you know, catchphrase when you're out in an airport and you guys, I'm sure, in uniform have heard it, thank you for your service. But do those people really know what they're saying? You know, all the time. And I understand that they're, they're, they don't know much about the military, sure. but. After watching this, I would hope the next time they do that, they're going to know because they're going to hear Billy's story. They're going to hear Kelly's story. And they're not all sad stories. You know, there's light at the end of the tunnel. And I think that's important. We talk about that all the time because you don't want it to be about, you know, oh, I'm a broken down vet. You know, it's like, yeah, I went We've through heard this. that story. Yeah. 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 yeah that's right. The whole, and that's, that's Hollywood's story. Yeah. And too. that's the whole point of this entire thing is to find some light in all of it and to understand and just show other whoever else the message is like you're not alone, you know, and coping with your shit. Like there's other people out there and there is a way 
And I think that I've, everybody can get. And involved. I think people, the civilian world, is are going to relate to this story too, just on the emotional human aspect of it. You know, it's like I talked about this a while ago. It, it, it reminds seeing Kelly's kid and seeing Billy's kids. It reminded me of Schindler's List at the end of the movie when you see those generations of Jews mm -hmm. who are putting rocks on Schindler's grave, and they're all alive because of what Schindler did. So we see these kids, and that's what I think about. You know. And I think people are going to relate to that, mm. especially when they hear from those kids. Yeah, that's powerful. Yeah. That, yeah. that would make me tune in. That would make me subscribe, thinking I'm not a guy that spent 24 years in the Marine Corps. Because a lot of people think this is what we do. We just march around the rifle on our shoulder and, you know, hub tube. And it's all about the, the, the fighting and the yeah, combat yeah. and the friction or the loss. But that's... That's something I think people will really want to get behind for the gift documentary and the connection, not just of those surrounding that singular day, everything that's come after that is really the powerful message that I think you're bringing to everyone with, with this, with this project, man, it's, it's going to be huge. And I'm, you know, I'm a big supporter of this. You've got a lot of support behind it right now. And like many in the veteran space. And again, I don't, I thank you for your service, anybody that served and, uh, you don't have to quantify it by guys that raised the right hand and, and took an oath and to share this with other guys in the documentary film world and make this different and have everyone support it. You, you're going to be really one of the plank owners for this generation of war and sharing these stories. And I think it's important because I don't want to wait 50 years to share this story. I want it to be told now before Trent's 70 years old and he can't remember which shoe to tie Wait, first. you're not 70? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm 70. I, I, just, I just think it's really important. So if people want to support the film, I, I mean, let's just get into it and tell, tell people where to go to support the film. Yeah, you can find us on Facebook uh, at The Gift Documentary. On Instagram, it's the same thing, at The Gift Documentary. And Twitter is at The Gift Doc. So all these years later, Dunham's still leading, obviously. He's got all his peers out there trying to, you know, appreciate the gift, lived up to the standard. What has he taught you? You don't get to fucking arrive as a leader and then call it good and hang your shit up, right? It's, it's something that you have to earn every day from your Marines. You don't get to just hang that as a title around your neck and then fucking walk off into the goddamn sunset, right? It's, it's something you have to earn every day. And I think that's what a good leader does, is, is they feel a sense of obligation to their Marines to not let them down, right? I mean, he, he extended his deployment. Uh, he extended his enlistment so that he could make that entire deployment. He was supposed to EAS in July. Mm. But once he was assigned squad leader, he extended his EAS. And he told his Marines, he said, I'm staying the whole fucking time. You guys are there, I'm going to be there. Because I'm going to bring you all back to life. And he kept his fucking promise. Mm. Every Marine from Kilo 4-2 fucking came back alive. Do you... Now that you've learned all these lessons, do you get up and take that picture now, whatever that moment is? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. No. I, I don't miss a chance to to hug a Marine. I don't miss a chance to fucking get a photo. Um, and there's there's another lesson about missing hugs that I'll forever regret with another Marine that was killed uh, from 1-7, Lieutenant Ron Winchester in... September during our our turnover with one seven. But yeah, I, I learned a lot during that deployment about putting aside your the expectations of machismo or stoic leadership as in its traditional sense where men don't fucking cry and don't show emotion that's all bullshit but i learned that it's that it's good to fucking to be human and that 
few Marines appreciate a human being. You know, like, and, and Dunham's a perfect example of that, right? He was crowned leader because he was a good fucking human being.